want to welcome you out today and uh, thank God his presence is here. You know, I tell you what, I, I, I wouldn't want to be without the presence of God. I mean, if you know, we, we need, we need God's presence. We need his power. Amen. We need his, we need his anointing. We need his glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, uh, well, bless the Lord. If you have your Bibles there like we do, we hold them up. Let's hold our Bibles up. Hold your Bible up like that. Wave it around a little bit. We always like to make the devil mad and Jesus glad and say this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. The Word is a lamp unto my feet. The Word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light into my path. And a light into my path. I receive the light. I receive the light. I believe the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. Because it is impossible. For God to lie. For God to lie. Hallelujah. Amen. We believe that. We believe that. Well, you know, a story is told that a ship was sailing at night when it received a message. Turn south immediately. You're headed straight toward me. The captain of the ship didn't want to turn south in the middle of the night. He didn't want to alter his course in any way, in fact. So he replied, I'm a Navy captain. You turn north. Well, the captain waited briefly and then received another message. You're headed straight toward me. Turn south now. I will not turn north. Now, at this point, the captain became irritated because this conversation was going on so long and his authority was not being respected. So he replied, this is my final statement. I am a Navy captain. I will not turn south. You will turn north. Well, the captain barely had time to deliver his message before he received an adamant reply. You will turn south. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You see, no matter who you are, no matter what ship you're steering, the lighthouse is never going to adjust to you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much education you have, what successes you have had. If you're a ship in conflict with a lighthouse, the lighthouse will win every single time. Amen. Now, many of us, for some reason, don't seem to understand that. I mean, we think everyone and everything needs to adjust to us, including God. But I want you to know, if you and God are not seeing things the same way, you and I must adjust to him. God will never adjust to you, and he will never adjust to me. And here's the deal. If you want to call your own shots, well, go ahead and make your own world. Huh? See, this is God's world, and he says what's go what goes. See, many of us try to dictate to God where we want him to go and what we want him to do, forgetting that he's the lighthouse and we're not. He directs the path, not us. He is Lord of our lips. <laughs> we are not. Chaos, beloved, ensues. When we set ourselves up as the ones to determine what we should say and when we should say it. When we do not surrender our thoughts and our words to God, we can expect negative outcomes as a result. Yeah. Words matter. Yeah. We've already seen from Proverbs 18.21 that the power of life and death is in the tongue. With our tongue, we find that we can bless or curse because words have power spiritual repercussions. I want to reiterate some facts concerning words that we shared last time. And we'll add to this as we go. But you can speak life to your life or death to your life based on the words you speak. 
every person will stand before God one day and give an account basically for two things. Number one, the deeds we have done that are not under the blood of Jesus. And two, the words we have spoken. Yeah. Our words are either a healing or a destructive force. Our words promote either health or sickness. Our words connect us to either life or death, blessing or cursing. Your greatest weapon for good or evil is in your mouth. Words are the most powerful things in the universe. And again, I want to reiterate because someone's always going to say that you said something you didn't say. I did not say that words are more powerful than God. I don't believe God is a thing. But I did say words are the most powerful things in the universe. Yep. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a lie. Your words can either be, and I added this one this week, your words can either be influenced and fueled by heaven or directed and dictated by hell and sometimes in very close proximity to one another. <laughs> Watch your mouth. Jesus wants to be and needs to be Lord of your lips. Turn with me if you have your Bibles, and I know many of you held your Bibles up there, so I know that you do. Uh, let's come over here to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Hallelujah. Thank God for His Word. Amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Now we're going to look at three verses here initially. We'll be looking at a fourth here just shortly. But we're going to look at three verses here, beginning with verse 21. And I don't mind telling you, these verses are pregnant with insight and application. Now, I'm going to not read the text right up front, but I'm going to read it as we go. We're going to go through these verses. First of all, I want you to know that Jesus being Lord of your lips means we speak and agree with what God says. Now, that seems pretty rudimentary, perhaps, maybe elementary. But Jesus being Lord of your lips means we speak and agree with what God says. Look at verse 21 of our opening. Verse 21 of Matthew's Gospel 16. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, I want you to know that from that time, this incident, when we see that phrase, from that time, this incident recorded here occurred about six months prior to the crucifixion of Christ. In the two and a half years of ministry prior to this, Jesus had mentioned his death only three times. But from this time forth, as the time is drawing closer, Jesus began to expound on it more frequently, in fact, mentioning it another 11 times in the next six months. This time that we record and have, we have recorded here in verse 21 was the fourth of 14 total times that Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection. Seven of them were in private, seven were in public, some of these were in parable form of one kind of another, but seven of them very clearly prophesied his death and resurrection. Jesus said, I am going to the cross, I am going to suffer many things, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, but I will raise again the third day. Jesus repeated that repeatedly, and still his disciples, many of them, didn't get it. I want you to know something about Jesus, and that is that Jesus was and is the living Word of God. Didn't John 1.1 1, 1 say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God the same? The Word, that is, was in the beginning with God. Yeah. 
Jesus was and is the living word of God. But here's what we have to understand how he spoke and how he speaks today. He speaks in line with and in agreement with the written word of God. Here's what you have to understand about the word of God. And here's why, you know, I know some people probably think I'm a bit of a nerd and I'm, I'm a bit intense. But I'm going to tell you something. I am very intense about this book. I'm intense about the Word of God. I want to tell you the key to changing and transforming your life from what it is to what you need it to be and what God wants it to be. The key to that is found in the Word of God. Now, Jesus and the written word agree because Jesus, the living word, and the Bible, the written word, are one. There is no separation. The word, Jesus is the word of God in skin, and the Bible is the word of God in print. Hallelujah. That's how important the word is. The word isn't something that you can just, oh, you know, pick up once in a while, reach in your little promise box and pull out your little card every day. No, you need to be in the word because the key to transforming your life is found in the word of God. Hallelujah. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit is the author of the written word. The language of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. I want to say that again. The language of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. I, have a, I, I hear from a lot of people that say the Holy Spirit is, just speaks to them all the time, every day. The Holy Spirit tells them to get up and brush their teeth. The Holy Spirit tells them what to have for breakfast. The Holy Spirit tells them where to go that day and what to do. You know what? Some people, some Christians believe they're getting more revelation from the Holy Spirit than the Apostle Paul did, who wrote almost half the New Testament. Oh, they're hearing from the Holy Spirit all the time. Let me tell you something. This might be a little bit of a side journey. I don't, I don't usually do that, but, but this might be a little bit of a side journey. Here it is. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. People say, well, the Holy Spirit told me this. The Holy Spirit told me that. The Holy Spirit told me that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can tell you that many of the things that people are claiming the Holy Spirit told them, he did not tell them. Why do you say that, Pastor Kevin? Because they are not speaking in line with the written word of God and the language of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. Never forget that. If you believe that you're receiving a word from God, you better be able to go to the book and back it up because the Bible tells us to test the spirits to see whether they be of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A lot of people that claim they're hearing from the Holy Ghost, they're hearing from a spirit all right, but it's not the Holy Spirit. They're hearing maybe from their own spirit, just conjuring things up, and, or, or they're actually yielding because they've yielded to deception and they've opened a door to now where they're being deceived by evil spirits masquerading as the Holy Spirit. That's serious. Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. That's serious. Now, okay, there's the side journey. But if you want to be able to discern and hear the Spirit's voice and discern His direction in your life more clearly, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to spend more time reading, studying, and meditating the Word. Amen. Reading, studying, and meditating the Word. Then we need to start speaking in line with the Word. Hallelujah. Yeah. See, that's where the power is. That's where the power is. Speaking in line with the word of God. You see, Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three 23, that we can have what we say, but many Christians just spend time saying what they have. Now, you'll catch that a little later. Hallelujah. But let, let, let's, let's just go on here. 
Jesus was speaking, and I got to hurry, in line with his destiny and the Father's plan. He said, I am going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised from the dead. He was speaking in line with his calling, his destiny, and the Father's plan. Jesus yes. was speaking the word of God. But here's something else. Our words can either be influenced and fueled by heaven or directed and dictated by hell. Look at verses 22 and 23 of our opening. It says, and then Peter took him aside, Jesus, that is, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned, Jesus, that is, and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Here's what we see. Peter was at variance here with what Jesus said. Peter's words and Jesus' words didn't agree. Jesus said one thing and Peter said another. And they were completely opposite one another. Their words didn't agree. Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to be tortured and, and I'm, going to be, I'm going to be abused and I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die and I'm going to raise the third day. And Peter said, not so, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. Their words didn't agree. You see, now in Peter's defense, let's not be too difficult on Peter here. Because Peter really thought he was protecting Jesus. Peter had good intentions. He thought he had Jesus back. In fact, Peter was even speaking what we could call Christianese. What's that? Our own language that we have as Christians. We can call it Christianese. That is, he was speaking words we as believers would be familiar with. After all, he called Jesus Lord. He said, it shall not be to you. It's not going to happen to you, Lord. He called him Lord, and, 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 and he, he was trying to think theologically. He was trying to think spiritually. He was trying to think biblically, but evidently, watch this, evidently, you can preface a statement with Lord and be speaking influenced by the devil. Hmm. Why? Because when, Jesus, when Peter was done speaking, Jesus identified what Peter had said with the devil. Hmm. Let's understand a couple of things here, please. Number one, Jesus was not, Jesus was not calling Peter Satan. A lot of people have thought he was. No, Jesus was not calling Peter Satan. There are two thoughts here. Jesus was addressing the spirit behind what Peter said. At that moment, Peter was being influenced by the devil in what he said. At that moment, Peter was yielding to the devil. Didn't realize he was, but he was. The second thing is, I believe Jesus was speaking from an Hebraic perspective. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, in Hebraic thought, the concept of Satan as the devil was not as clearly developed as it is in the New Testament. In fact, in Hebrew thought, a ha Satan, ha Satan, the Satan, ha Satan just meant the adversary. And so anyone who was being an adversary at that point to you was acting in the role of an hasetan. And so Jesus was speaking from an Hebraic perspective here. But Peter called him Lord. Now, what's implied in referring to Jesus as Lord? Well, the Greek word kurios carries with it the idea of supreme in authority, controller, sir, or master. So to call Jesus Lord, let's follow this out, if he is supreme in authority, if he is the controller, 
If he is sir, if he is master, and all those things are in that Greek word kurios, translated Lord. If Jesus is Lord, to call Jesus Lord is to call yourself a slave. Now, we see this in Paul's opening words in Romans. Paul wrote, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. We see the same thing with James, the Christ's half-brother, opening his letter with James, a servant of God. Jude, another half-brother of Jesus, says Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. Let's understand the job of a slave. Let's understand the job of a servant. The job of a slave is to follow the dictates of his master. As children of God, we are Christ's slaves. Too many of us, however, want to be like Peter and refer to Jesus as Lord while spouting our own ideas and opinions. You know, we're, we're, we're great with calling Jesus Savior. Oh, this dismissing hell and going to heaven stuff is great. Are you kidding me? Calling Jesus Savior and get a get out of hell card. Do not go to hell. Do not class go. Do not collect $200. I mean, Jesus, oh yeah, I'll take him as Savior. But man alive, far too many people don't want him mis messing with them as Lord. Yeah. Uh, but see, he's got to be Lord and Savior. When Jesus is your Lord, let's understand this. I, I, I get so weary with pop culture Christianity. Let's understand something here. When Jesus is your Lord, he's not your personal assistant. When Jesus is Lord, he's not your co-pilot. When Jesus is Lord, he's not your mentor. When Jesus is Lord, he's not your life coach. Jesus, as the great, late, late, great A.W. Tozer said, Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not the Lord at all. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, you and I have the devil in our mouth. Anytime you speak that which stems from your desires or your perspectives rather than God's. That holds true even if those desires and perspectives aren't evil by the world's standards. <coughs> see, I know that I'm pretty intense. I know that I am very serious about the things of God. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. It's time in this hour in which we live, it's time that we be very, very intent and serious in our walk with God. Yes. Yes. The end of all things is upon us, and we need to be speaking in line with with God's word. Now, lastly, let me, let me, let me, I've got to hurry. Let me get a drink here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thirdly, when our words agree with God's word, we are blessed. When our words are out of sync with God's will, that is his word, we become a mouthpiece for hell. Listen to verse 23 again. Watch this. But he turned, that is Jesus, and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And just a few verses earlier, back in verse 17, Jesus said Peter was blessed. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Why was Peter blessed in verse 17? Because he spoke that which the Father revealed. But by verse 22, Jesus is having to rebuke Peter and actually say, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because Peter was now speaking in alignment with the enemy rather than God. Folks, this shows us how quickly our tongues can flip. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about that, get thee hence beside, behind me, Satan. A story is told one day of a man who came home. 
And his wife had bought a very expensive, he could tell, expensive dress. Now, his wife wanted to know how she looked in the dress. The husband wanted to know how much it cost. Huh? And, and she told the husband how much it cost. He just about went through the ceiling. I mean, this was an expensive dress. And he said to his wife, why did you spend that much on a dress? And she says, well, I tried it on, and the devil told me I was stunning in it. And he said, why didn't you say, get thee hits behind me, Satan? She said, I did. And he said, it looks good back there, too. <clears throat> anyway. Praise the Lord. Get thee hits behind me, Satan. Huh. Now, your tongue and my tongue can actually block what God wants to do for you because your, our tongue gets in the way. Jesus said, Peter, you are an offense to me. Now, that's the Greek word skandalon, and a skandalon originally was a bait stick that bait was on, they would put it in a snare or a trap to attract an animal, uh, a monkey or whatever the case, but a scandalon was a bait stick, and, and Jesus here in the Greek, it says, you are a scandalon to me. You're this bait stick. You're, a, you're an offense to me. Well, an offense in one case is a stumbling block. He said, you're a stumbling block to me, Peter. You're in the way. You're standing between me right now and the Father's plan and the Father's will. There is an impediment placed in the way. See, Peter chose to think and react to a situation as an earthly-minded person rather than a spiritually-minded person. So at that point, he actually positioned himself between Christ and the Father's will. He became the roadblock as a result of his words. There's another thought there. In calling Peter a scandalon, he recognized in Peter's words the snare of the enemy being set to keep Jesus from going to the cross. It was a trap. Jesus recognized it and rebuked him. But watch this. When Peter agreed with God, Jesus said he was blessed. When he spoke out of sync with God's will, God's word, he became a mouthpiece of hell. Why? Because he revealed a heart that lacked faith in what God said to be true. See, our words are simply vocalizations of our thoughts and our beliefs. Our words reveal what is really in our heart. Jesus said in Luke 6 to 45, in part of that verse, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you realize Jesus said that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why you need to have the right thing in your heart. You need to fill your heart, praise God, with the word of God, because when the word is abundantly in your heart, the word will come abundantly out of your mouth. But see, if your heart's full of fear and unbelief and doubt and all of these other things and the philosophies of man, if your heart's full of that, then that's what's going to be coming out of your mouth. We need to be people, beloved, who fill our hearts and fill our minds with this book, the Word of God. We fill our minds with so many things. We fill our hearts with so many things. But we need to fill our heart with the Word of God. I want you to know in conclusion, Jesus is powerful. And his words are powerful. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, 33, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. 
So when you speak his word, you're utilizing and accessing his power. That's why we're instructed to let his words live large inside us. The Bible says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, that is abundantly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. One last verse, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, it means denying yourself, your interests, your wants, your ideas. Taking up your cross, by the way, doesn't mean suffering from hay fever foot problems, a heart murmur, or even cancer. Taking up your cross means that you identify with Jesus to the point of suffering, shame, rejection, and perhaps even death. Taking up your cross is something you choose to do, not something you put up with. It's a choice to deny yourself, a determination that no matter what, you'll stand for Jesus. You'll stand for his word. You'll stand for truth. And beloved, it starts with getting your words aligned with him. Amen. Yes. It is agreeing with Jesus and saying the same things he does. It is to make Jesus the Lord of your lips. Let Christ be Lord over your lips and he will be Lord over your life, giving you full access to his wisdom, grace, power, victory, and freedom. Sounds like a pretty good trade, wouldn't you agree? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. We thank you that your word is alive. We thank you that we've had the opportunity to look to your word. Now, Father, we just believe that the word will take root in those who have heard it. They'll meditate on the word they've heard. They'll spend time in your word. And, Lord, that your name would be honored and glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Now, yes, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to have you pray for the kids uh, that's going to camp. Yes, tomorrow. we've got... Uh, uh, Noah, could you come up here, buddy? Uh, Ruby's not here, but you could come up here, buddy. I want to pray for, we've got, we've got two kids going to uh, junior camp this week, Noah and Ruby. My friend Noah's here is going to camp, right? You're going to camp, buddy? I'm going to put you on the spot here. You're on live TV right now. <laughs> um, now listen, when you get back to camp, would you be willing, I'm going to ask Ruby the same thing, would you be willing to get up and share a little bit about your camp experience next Sunday maybe? You think about it. Maybe, okay. If I, if, I, if I could work out some kind of bribe or something, you think maybe you would like <laughs> some gifts or gifts or something, maybe a little cash. Or, I'm just or this way. I'm just kidding. That's moving a little bit by this camera. We want to pray for uh, want to pray for Noah, we want to pray for Ruby. They're getting ready all, to go to camp this week. All, all the kids, yes. Yeah. But I mean, from our church, we've got two going. We've got Ruby and we've got my, my friend Noah here going. And you're, you're a good looking guy, you know that? Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for these kids that are going to camp. Father, we just ask that you would just bless them, Father, that they would receive abundantly from you, that your spirit would touch them in the name of Jesus and give them a life-changing experience. All those kids, we plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus as they go to camp. Lord, bless them and give them a glorious time, we pray, in Jesus' name and safe travels. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bless you, buddy. All right. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine up upon you and, and get, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I uh, bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I declare that you are blessed to be a blessing. You were blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. You're blessed this week, and all you set your hand to, it is blessed, and it prospers, and your light shines before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven.
Amen. Amen. And we bless you in Jesus' name. We'll dismiss you on that note.